Hello everyone, I'm Paul Daniels with Jimmy Bell, and this is the weekly lineup. On Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern, we have Leadership with Bianca Kovic. At 10 p.m., Parent Pump Radio with Jacqueline Wynn. And at 10.30, Two Pips Talking with Daniel and Matt. And on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, we have Second Amendment Talk with Daniel and Rod. At 9 p.m., we have What's the Story with Maria. And at 10 p.m., we have Unleashed with Donald Wisman. And on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., we have Unscheduled with Les Skymo and the Dane. At 8 p.m., All You Can Eat with Rob Rosenthal. At 9 p.m., All Aboard with Donald Wisman. And at 10, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah Yusupov. And on Thursdays at 8 p.m., we have Ask for Candy with Candace Hopper. And at 10 p.m., we have Night Talk with Joe Rocks. And on Fridays at 8 p.m., it's Pod Talk with Jimmy and me. 9 p.m., All Aboard with Donald Wisman. And at 10 p.m., Betrayal with Casey Spears. That's the weekly lineup. Enjoy. The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions, and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. User joined your channel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to All You Can Eat. It's the podcast about deliciousness. I am Rob Rosenthal, your host. Excited to be with you uh, here uh, tonight live on the uh, last day of September uh, of the year 2020. This is episode number 91 of uh, All You Can Eat. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to those of you who have been here before. Hello to anybody that's new to the program we uh, we talk about things that are delicious here. Mostly, uh, those are things that you uh, eat, but they're not confined uh, or limited only to those things that you eat. Because uh, there's a lot of things about life that are uh, delicious, I suppose, I believe. And uh, and so uh, this evening uh, we're going to talk about some of the uh, the, the the foods uh, that are uh, coming up in the fall. Uh, since it has just uh, transitioned uh, to a uh, brand new season here uh, in, uh, well, anywhere. I mean, I suppose if you live in these United States of America, even though you can hear us anywhere in the world at this point, uh, as we move into uh, fall, it's an exciting time for the people that cook because it, uh, you, can, you are presented with a new range of, um, of, uh, of foods uh, to, uh, you know, to prepare. I love the summer. I love the tomatoes. I love the corn. I love the, uh, you know, the stuff that sprouts out of the ground. But I'll tell you, you know, a lot of chefs love their uh, fall. They love the fall vegetables, the cauliflower that's coming up, the Brussels sprouts, the different, uh, you know, the different veg, uh, the, you, you know, the, the preparation style kind of segues into more, you know, less kind of quick cooking, uh, less on the grill and kind of more into the, uh, the oven and into that braising pot. And so it's a good time. Now, uh, also uh, this evening, I thought uh, in addition to taking you through some of the deliciousness that I myself have been experiencing, uh, 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 foods, uh, recipes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that I think are easy for uh, you or anyone for that matter to kind of replicate if you're interested in doing that kind of thing. But in addition to all that, I have a nice conversation with a country music uh, disc jockey. Her name is Amy Brown uh, out of Nashville, uh, Tennessee, and we talk about farmers because she's doing some interesting work to kind of promote the uh, 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 the work, the uh, uh, the growth, the, um, the 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 dairy uh, that is being produced by our nation's uh, farmers. So I'm going to uh, have a chat with her, and hopefully, technically speaking, that will uh, show up on uh, on tonight's uh, program. And uh, if you're uh, listening live uh, here on the 30th day of September 2020, and you got a question or you got a comment or you just feel like chit chatting, I believe uh, that if I give you the following number, it is available for you. And I don't know, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. 
800-508-5431. It's 800-508-5431. This is uh, All You Can Eat. I'm Rob Rosenthal. Now, I want to start with the dinner that I just finished having, the dinner that I just finished making. We are six months basically into the user left your channel kind of uh, stay at home uh, situation. Uh, where, I don't know, I've been cooking my brains out. Which is fine for me, because I like doing that. I'll pick up the occasional, I mean, they're starting to reopen some restaurants. I'm coming to you from New York. I'm coming to you right now from the eastern end of uh, Long Island. Uh, But in New York and New York State, New York City, they are kind of reopening restaurants, at least with a limited capacity. I think it's like 25%. I don't know how many restaurants, well, I do, to be honest with you. 25% 25% capacity inside is not, you can't really make it on that in the restaurant business. But if you add that to the outdoor dining and to the takeout and to whatever other things that people are doing, uh, some restaurants are, are able to, uh, you, you know, stay in business. So I guess w- what I would say is if, uh, if you have restaurants that you like uh, locally, uh, do your best to uh, support them. That said, I have been cooking, as I mentioned, uh, my brains out this evening. I uh, I did the pork chops on the bone. So let's start from the beginning. They are purchased at Costco. And they are purchased at Costco because you are listening to the Costco Ho. I get to Costco as often as I can. These days I, I, I go there, uh, you, you know, wearing a mask and uh, avoiding humanity. But uh, once again, uh, the product... Uh, is what it's all about. And I I love shopping there, and I love their stuff. And one of the things that I like at the Costco is the very thick-cut pork chops on the bone. They come in a package of six. And that's going to easily feed six people because these are some fat-ass chops. And they're on the bone. Given the choice between on the bone and not on the bone, I will always, as I think many uh, cooks uh, will, uh, choose on the bone. Uh, for two reasons. One, uh, generally speaking, because you're going to get more flavor from it. And secondly, because we like gnawing on the bone. You could keep the rest of the chop. Just give me the bone and the meat around the bone. I'm happy. Pick up a half a dozen of these guys, and uh, I immediately go about the process of uh, freezing a bunch of them because, uh, you know, I'm not going to eat. We're not going to eat, even in my family here. We're not going to eat a half a dozen pork chops uh, soon enough uh, to keep them in the refrigerator. So I freeze, freeze some. And I, I mentioned that because some things are better uh, frozen uh, than others. And I find that these bone in pork chops freeze very well. Now, uh, <clears throat> while you could take these uh, pork chops and season them and put them in a skillet and, uh, you know, sear them up and they'd be perfectly good. <clears throat> one of the things that I, I do is that I, <clears throat> I brine them. What's brine? Brine is uh, uh, basically a <clears throat> it's a it's a solution. It's a it's water and and salt. I mean, in its simplest form, uh, brining is uh, soaking some uh, meat, some protein in a combination of water and salt. And the classic kind of brine uh, ratio is that for every say gallon of water that you use, you would use a cup of salt. So you can go from there. If you're only going to, you know, if you don't need a whole gallon of water and you're only going to use a half a gallon, then you would use, of course, a half a cup of salt. I will tell you that there is nothing to prevent you from adding other ingredients to your brine, including, by the way, a sweet element, in which case I might throw in a little sugar, as I did in this case. Uh, When I have some uh, garlic around the house, I might smash a couple of cloves and put them in the water, the brining solution. Uh, a handful of uh, black uh, peppercorns, uh, uh, maybe a, uh, 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 a thing of a thing, a, you know, a, a, a herbs uh, you could throw in if you have those in the house, whether they're dried or whether they're on the, the little vine, uh, a rosemary, whatever it is. Uh, I learned uh, a couple of weeks ago in, uh, when I was, as I was interviewing Joey, the chef uh, of the Little Al in New York City, Joey Campanaro, when I was interviewing him, he puts a lot of the uh, fennel uh, seeds into the brine, which is great when you're doing pork because fennel and pork go beautifully together. In fact, when you have sausage, one of the things that stands out 
is the flavor of fennel. Uh, that slight kind of almost uh, licorice-y uh, 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 flavor. So long story short, I take a couple of these, well, I guess long story short is impossible at this point, but I take a couple of these big, fat, and I mean fat, I mean these things are an inch and a half uh, thick uh, on the bone uh, pork chops. I put them into a plastic uh, bag, sealable plastic bag, enough water to cover them, which I imagine in my case with only two pork chops, you're looking at basically, some, you know, let's say a quart of water, right? 32 ounces, maybe it's a little bit more. A whole bunch of salt. And then, as I said, I got some black peppercorns. Uh, they're going in. I have some garlic uh, uh, cloves uh, li- li- sitting around. I-, I may throw a couple of those in. Uh, uh, I'm going to put in a couple, two, three, four teaspoons of uh, sugar, give it a little bit of sweetness, not necessary, not required. Uh, and uh, and I got a handful of fennel seeds going there. So they sit in the refrigerator for however long you can. In my case, it's overnight. It's 24 hours. So 12 hours after I put them in, I turn it over on the other side, make sure that both sides are, are being soaked. So now the question is, why brine? And the answer is uh, flavor. And the answer is uh, moisture. Uh, I find consistently, uh, whether it's pork chops or the whole pork loin that does not have the bone or anything else that you end up brining, a lot of people brine their chicken, uh, that it, that it, uh, it uh, not only delivers extra uh, flavor, uh, but it's really good from a moisture standpoint. You know, pork chops, I had, a, it took me a long time to figure out how to make pork chops without drying them out. And part of what helps me now is not only to know when to pull them off. You know what I mean? You could either feel it or, you know, if you're not 100% sure, you got a, a thermometer. You see that thermometer hit like 140, 135, you, you pull it off and let it rest for a little bit. That's a good temperature. But part of what makes uh, the, the keeps the pork chops moist at this point is the fact that they've been brined and flavored for 24 hours. I can't even begin to tell you how fantastic uh, those pork chops are. Served in my case with some uh, steamed string beans, uh, simple. Also purchased at the uh, Costco, squeeze of uh, lemon, a little bit of olive oil, some salt. And you know what? I got a bag in my house of uh, a, a bag of slivered almonds. I mentioned this because I did put some toasted almonds on the string beans, in, making them a string beans almondine, because you don't fancy that way. But uh, it occurred to me when I took the first batch of slivered almonds out of the toaster oven, burnt to a crisp, that I... Uh, with 700 hours of professional training and a professional cooking degree, I realized that I burn my toasted nuts 50% of the time. Half the time that I'm toasting nuts, they end up uh, burnt to a crisp, whether they're almonds, whether they're pine nuts, whether whatever kind of nuts they are. Uh, and you can do it one of two ways. Now, first of all, there's nothing better toasted uh, than nuts. I mean, sure, a piece of toast is good also, but you want toast on nuts, it completely develops uh, the flavor, that little bit of brownness that comes from caramelization that uh, happens because there's some uh, natural uh, oil and, uh, and, uh, and some sugars, obviously, in the, in the... It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. All nuts are better when they're toasted, period, end of story. You could do it in the toaster oven, or you could do it on top of the stove in a, uh, you know, in a saute pan, a fry pan, a skillet, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, you know, they go from uh, brown, which you're looking for, to uh, to toast, to burnt, in relatively no time. In which case, uh, you've rendered them uh, worthless. Worthless. So, uh, <clears throat> keep your eye. This is not one of those things that you can put the toaster oven on and then, and then uh, you know, do something else. Because the, whatever else you're doing eventually translates into you're burning your nuts. 50% of the time, I'm a professional. So that uh, nuts went on top of the, uh, the string beans. The uh, pork chop is brined and, and seared like a mother in a cast iron uh, skillet. Uh, if I had the energy, if I had the interest, if I had the patience, I, I would have put on a, a, a grill fire because those things are great on a grill. But you know what? They're also perfectly, perfectly wonderful. Uh, in, uh, made in a cast iron pan on top of the stove, put the fan on uh, before the fire alarm goes on. Really good. Seared, 
pull them off 135, 140, let them rest for a couple of minutes. That's deliciousness. And as if that's not enough, uh, I'm a flavor whore as well. I have a little bit of onion. I've got a little bit of tomato. I lo- I've got a little bit of garlic. I love working with the leftovers. I chop up the tomato. I put a couple of cl- I chop up a couple of cloves of garlic. I got like a quarter of an onion, and I happen to have in my uh, refrigerator a jar of uh, Calabrian chili peppers, red peppers soaking in oil. They got some heat to them. So you don't need a lot. I, maybe I added like a teaspoon or two to the onion, uh, uh, garlic, uh, tomato combo, sauteed it for about 5-10 minutes, and I mean, that's all you need to do. So whether or not you want to bring some intensity to the string beans, whether or not you want to put it on top of a potato, whether or not you want to have a little uh, bite, uh, a little heat with your pork chop, that was dinner this evening, and man, I just love that. And I'm happy, like I said, just eat the bone. Uh, now, the other pork chop play, let me see if I can find this right here. This is always the uh, seared scallops. No. What is that pork chop recipe that I love so much? Stay with me. Uh, all right, hang on. Stay with me because I need, I thought I had it right in front of me. Where are you? Oh, here's uh, Tony's pork chops. Okay, here we go. Let's open this. Okay. Yeah, there you go. I caught a recipe today that if I had the ingredients, I would have made this instead of what it was that I just described to you. This is today's uh, New York Times, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, What I'm looking at here is called Tony Tipton Martin, that's the chef, pork chops in lemon caper sauce. Now, I only didn't make it because while I have lemons in the house and probably every other thing that you need in this recipe, I don't happen to have capers on hand, which is unusual. It's unusual because uh, it's one of the items that you should always keep in your uh, pantry or your refrigerator after you open it because capers, uh, a ton of flavor. Uh, you know, maybe you're, se- maybe you're searing uh, some, uh, you know, chicken breasts, and you want to, you know, bring a little flavor. So you squeeze in some lemon, uh, you throw in a little knob of butter, you throw in some capers. You got a beautiful, you know, thing. Tony Tipton uh, Martin, uh, adapted by Sam. Today's New York Times, if you're interested, uh, pork chops in lemon caper sauce. Now, had I studied the recipe, I might have been inclined to avoid it anyway because I don't generally follow recipes that have more than like six or seven ingredients. Um, In this case, my exception is that it's only a three-step recipe because I don't want to go more steps than that. And most of the ingredients, uh, uh, it's not unusual to have a lot of these ingredients on hand. I'm going to tell you, for example, I got the pork chops. I know that I have salt and freshly ground uh, black pepper. This one also calls for some dried uh, thyme leaves. Uh, it's both a combination of olive oil and butter. I got those on hand. Uh, there's some garlic in the recipe and some flour. I happen to have those. Now, she's also included in the recipe a small uh, shallot. So that's not the kind of thing that you always have. I don't think it's crucial uh, to the recipe. If you had a red onion, that would be fine. If you just used the garlic, that would probably be okay, too. I like a shallot. It's somewhere in that garlic slash uh, onion uh, family. And then uh, the recipe concludes with some white wine and some chicken stock and some capers. Maybe you have some parsley. You're going to use that for uh, garnish. And some of the the lemon, you're going to use some of the zest as well. There's also a little note on the recipe that says hot sauce, so optional, so that if you wanted to give it a little heat, you could. Anyway, I mentioned that because I, uh, I, while I didn't make that, if I had had capers on hand, even without the shallot, uh, pork chops in lemon caper sauce sound uh, quite yummy to me. Um, I want to do one other kind of recipe, two other recipe things, because I've been, like I said, I've been cooking a lot. And one of the things that I made recently 
is scallops. Now, again, uh, as a guy who has written a cookbook uh, predicated on the idea of getting the most flavor with the fewest ingredients and the least effort, I search for foods and recipes that uh, don't require a ton of work. I've always said you get the best ingredients you can. Don't mess them up too much. So I happen to be looking at a recipe here in the uh, Times and I have to say that I uh, I made this within the last week, or I made some variation of this. Seared scallops with jammy cherry tomatoes. I made it because I have some cherry tomatoes on hand. If I have cherry tomatoes on hand and I've got some scallops, I'm, uh, what else does she, what else do we have in this recipe? Uh, garlic, sure. White wine, fine. Uh, salt and pepper, yeah. Uh, some oil, some lemon. And then maybe you got some... Uh, you know, basil, mint, that kind of thing. And I have all of those things. So I made this. I want to just spend a second on scallops uh, for this reason. Uh, I spent, I've spent i spent a lot of time in Portland, Maine. And, like, when I say a lot of times, I mean, you know, I've been there ten times. And Portland, Maine is well-known uh, as probably the best uh, s- small city restaurant city in America. The food up there, the food scene, the restaurants are astronomically good. It's just great eating in Portland, Maine. There's just a ton of great, excellent food, terrific restaurants. I discovered uh, uh, by accident a uh, a place or maybe it wasn't by accident, but so long ago, it doesn't really much matter. And it's called Jay's Oyster Bar, like literally J apostrophe S Oyster Bar. Very kind of uh, low-key, <clears throat> blue, collarish. I mean, to the extent that you can be blue collar in, a, in what is essentially a tourist area. Oyster Bar, uh, <clears throat> lovely wood right on the water right on the dock, kind of place you go in, you're going to have a beer, you may have some uh, clams on the half shell, you may have some steamers. <clears throat> what I discovered there was that they they had scallops. Now remember, when you're in Maine, you are you have access to some of the great seafood in the United States of America, including probably the best lobster that you can get, if, if not in the, in the country, then almost in the world. But I, I see that they're, ser- they're, they're serving, uh, sure, I'll have some clams. Uh, sure, uh, shuck me up a dozen of those. Uh, I'll have a martini. Oh, uh, like that's Those are the two acceptable drinks, I would say, in this establishment. You can have a beer uh, or you can have a martini. And, you know, if you know me. So, uh, yeah, and that's a great combo, by the way, having a martini, a nice uh, classic kind of dry gin martini, maybe an olive uh, with some uh, clams, and I see that they have as an appetizer on the uh, menu, they have scallops. Have you ever seen scallops when they come in the, uh, in the, in the scallop shell? It's, that's, a, that's a beautiful shell. They don't normally serve them that way, and the only time you really will see them that way is if you go to like a fish market. Uh, and they don't serve them that way at Jay's either. They just uh, bring over, you have an appetizer, and, and in those days it was not uh, not a ton of money. To have five big, fat, juicy scallops come to the table as an appetizer. Five in that order. Big, fat, I mean uh, uh, su- su- sweet, plump. Uh, the, the I get excited. I salivate thinking about it. And let me explain to you that they're not cooked. They come to the table raw. You're going to eat them raw. They happen to uh, serve them with a little bit of that kind of, um, well, cocktail sauce. So it's tomato based with some horseradish, Worcestershire, that kind of thing in it. But you don't, you, you don't want really a lot of it. You 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 want to taste the the scallop itself, which has a taste of the uh, the, the 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 sea in a in a sweet way, and. Moreover, that scallop, <coughs> excuse me, that scallop, that it melts in your mouth. 
I would say that each scallop I probably cut into three, three pieces, three bites. Maybe the tiniest little dip of that cocktail sauce in the mouth, taste the sweetness of the sea, and then allow it to melt in your mouth. It's beautiful food. And it also occurred to me at some point, by the way, as someone who has been to, you know, uh, sushi restaurants, that if you go to a sushi restaurant and they're serving scallops, they would take these five scallops, they would cut it into, uh, I would say, 15 pieces of sushi at about $4, $4 uh, uh, you, you know, a piece. You're looking at $50, $60 worth of sushi. Here in Jay's Oyster Bar, those five scallops cost me 8 9 bucks, whatever it was. And they were awesome. Awesome. Now, the thing is that uh, you can you can cook salad, uh, you can cook scallops, like here, this uh, seared scallops with jammy cherry tomatoes. And I even have a recipe in my book. It's called uh, scallops provençal, meaning in the style of Provence, uh, France. <clears throat> and my recollection is that it'll have uh, some tomato in it and some garlic and uh, maybe some salt and, and some of the, the herbs that come from Provence. Herbs the Provence could include anything from like, uh, I don't know, rosemary and maybe thyme and, <clears throat> you know, those kind of things. <clears throat> Excuse me for choking because it makes no sense, but hang on a second. I'm just going to water up a little bit here. So you can cook scallops, and most of the time I discover that when scallops are cooked, uh, they're not they're not really done well. They uh, they're either overcooked or, or they're uh, they are um, uh, uh, they're just kind of flabby uh, and and don't have enough taste. And, and and so here's what you need to know about scallops: if you're not going to have them raw, and that's fine. If you can go to a a, a fish market to a fish monger and you know you're getting super fresh uh, uh, scallops, I, I believe me when I tell you, a thin uh, slice of scallop. Uh, on its own, uh, lovely. Try it that way. Uh, try it with a touch of uh, olive oil, a squeeze of lemon, and a little bit of uh, coarse uh, salt. I mean, perfect, perfect. Uh, try it if you want to go Japanese style with some, the tiniest little dip uh, in soy sauce. Great. But when it comes to cooking scallops, uh, what's important is... Very high heat, very, very dry scallops. Like, you dry them, you let them sit. Sometimes you let them sit in the refrigerator because they, they dry even better in the refrigerator for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Then you dry them again. Then you're going to hit the the, uh, the scallops up with salt and pepper, and you're going to put them in a very hot saute pan. High heat little bit of uh, olive oil for lubrication and you're going to sear them for one on one side and then you're going to gently turn them over and uh, heat them for one minute on the other and get them off but I mean you want to get a beautiful uh, brown uh, 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 sear indicating that you've caramelized them on one side so you need high heat super dry scallops don't crowd the pan, otherwise they get uh, moist and, and steamy. We don't want to steam them. We want to sear the heck out of them. That's how you want to eat a scallop. If you're going to cook it, it's going to be one minute high heat on each side until caramelized and brown. A little squeeze of lemon and call it a day. Now, in the case of this recipe and the other recipe that I have uh, made, uh, you actually do sear off the scallops first for a minute. You let them sit in aluminum for a minute. While you chop up the tomato, you put in a little bit of garlic, you put in some of your fresh uh, herbs and some salt and some olive oil, maybe a little thing of butter, and that's how it is that you're going to serve the, um, uh, the, 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 then you put the scallops back into that to warm back up, and boom, nice glass of uh, Sancerre, uh, Pinot Gris, other uh, crisp, uh, white, uh, Chablis, always good, dry the scallops, uh, put a heavy pan over high heat is good. I want to give you, and by the way, for me, when I get them fresh, trust me, I, I don't bother cooking them. I, I just, I'm happy slicing them, uh, serving it as I had, uh, as I had mentioned uh, before. Either way is good. And and I made something here recently that I have never made before, but I want to throw it out as one more 
kind of recipe concept before I take you over to my conversation with uh, Amy Brown. Uh, I made, and I'll tell you why I made it, because all the farms around here at this point are selling zucchini and they're selling squash and I got onions up the wazoo and the tomatoes are in season and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, what if I wanted to cook up that stuff? So I was going to somebody else's home. I was responsible for bringing a side, a dish. And you know what I made? Can you get, okay, here, I'm going to give you four ingredients. You tell me what I made. The ingredients are eggplant, tomato, squash, and zucchini. I made ratatouille. Ratatouille. Ratatouille it is a beautiful uh, melange of uh, vegetable. Uh, basically kind of cooked together, stewed, fantastic. Preheat the oven to 375, my friends. Slice eggplant, tomatoes. Uh, I use the Roma ones, like the small ones. Uh, squash, that's the yellow stuff, and zucchini, the green one. Slosh, uh, uh, slice everything into very small little rounds. Like when I say like like thin, I don't have to tell you that it's a sixteenth of an inch. I'm just telling you it's thin. Then what you're going to do is you're going to saute a little onion, garlic, and some bell peppers until they're soft. That takes 10 minutes. I got some onion sliced up. I got some bell peppers in the house. I got some garlic, a little olive oil in a pan, low heat, 10 minutes, beautiful. I season it with salt and pepper. I add in the crushed tomatoes to that because we're essentially making like a tomato sauce. Stir until all those ingredients are incorporated. I take it off the heat. I'm going to add in some fresh uh, basil to that. All right, so now I got this lovely tomato sauce that has the peppers and the garlic and the onion and a little bit of fresh basil. Great. Then I take these sliced vegetables, and I kind of put them in a pattern. I'm not really good at patterns, I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to bullshit you and tell you that I made something really beautiful. I just laid down one row of uh, eggplant on top of that. I lay down a row of, uh, uh, of a tomato on top of that. I lay down a row of squash on top of that. It's a layer of zucchini. And then I put the sauce all around that. I hit it up with salt and pepper. Why? Because you want to season in every level of the way. Right, And then after I do that first layering, I have enough to do it yet a second time. So I'm in the, you know, you could do this thing in one of those glass Pyrex things. You could do it in a, you know, it's a rectangular type of pan. You could do it in aluminum. You're laying down these thinly sliced vegetables. You're uh, layering them in with the, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the tomato sauce that you've made. You're seasoning it uh, with salt and pepper. And uh, you take that, and then what you do is uh, they have you make, uh, If this recipe that I used uh, has you make a, a, a seasoning out of herbs. So I take basil, garlic, parsley, thyme, salt, pepper, olive oil, and kind of, you know, ground it all together. Are you with me on this one? Basil, garlic, parsley, fresh thyme, salt, pepper, olive oil. It all gets kind of blended together, and it goes over those, uh, it goes over the vegetables in the pan. The pan gets covered with uh, aluminum foil. I bake for 40 minutes. I uncover it and then bake for another 20. So you got an hour of cooking in there. The first 40 minutes when it's covered, it's getting all steamed and yummy. The next, uh, the next 20 minutes is getting a little bit of uh, a little bit. It dries up a, t- a, t- a, t- a touch and you're getting a little bit of brown. And uh, you're thinking to yourself, man, that would be good if I threw some uh, mozzarella. You don't need it. It's a vegetable dish. And then an hour later, you have this beautiful, uh, uh, this just this beautiful taste from all of these fresh, thinly sliced uh, vegetables and the tomato sauce and the herbs that you have on top of this thing. And you have rat tattooey that you can have either as a main course, you can have as a side course, or you know, the day the day after. I got to I got to admit because I love my leftovers. I took all those leftovers, I threw them in some kind of like um, what do you call those white uh, ceramic dish. And I had some cheese in the house. You could grate cheese. You could put whatever. And I roasted that in the oven. And now you're having like a whole rat tattooey parmesan. Hey, now. That's so good. 
Uh, all right, so here's what we're going to do. Let's get Amy on the line here. How do we do this? Let's go like this. Oh, yeah, the studio. Work in the studio. Work in the studio to capacity. Let me get Amy here. How do I get Amy on the line? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Amy Brown and I uh, chat about her initiative, uh, which is intended uh, to help uh, dairy farmers. You should know in advance that when you go into the supermarket and you buy Land of Lakes uh, butter, Land of Lakes is a cooperative. It is made up of farmers, dairy farmers from around the country who produce high-quality ingredients that then get converted into the butter that you buy and other Land of Lake-type products. Amy's a disc jockey there in, uh, as I said, Nashville, uh, uh, Tennessee, and she's doing a program that we're going to talk about here. I am having a conversation with Amy Brown. How are you doing? Doing great. How about you? Excellent. Uh, thank you. Glad to, uh, glad to make your acquaintance. Um, where uh, where have I found you? Where in the world are you? I am in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, great place to be. Also, a place where you find Cheryl Crow, so it makes me happy. Yeah, I run into her at the grocery store. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I, li- I like that. When you're going out to uh, purchase some uh, Land of Lakes products. Exactly. Yep. It's kind of, that's just Nashville for you. You can run into pretty much any musician that lives here. They all kind of live their own life and run their own errands. It's pretty cool. Good. I like it. I like it a lot. Tell, uh, tell, uh, tell people about the, um, tell people about the, 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 the series. Okay. Well, the series with Lando Lakes that I am hosting is called where goodness grows. And as we all know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, but the dairy farmers at Lando Lakes, they're doing their part to make sure that, the food supply remains strong and they're working tirelessly to produce the food that a lot of us enjoy. And so Lando Lakes just wanted to get together and highlight all the dairy farmers that make up Lando Lakes. So we've got some interviews with farmers and their families. And it's almost like we're getting a peek behind the curtain of what goes into making the butter that you're buying on the shelf. So yeah, when I'm at the grocery store, maybe running into Cheryl Crow, if I go and I grab the Land Lakes butter, now that I've connected with these farmers, I don't just see packaging and butter. I, I see the farmers and the families that I connected with and their sense of work ethic, their sense of community and the hope that they offer. And then, you know, it just makes me feel a lot better about putting it in my basket. And then hopefully uh, when people watch the episodes, that work ethic and sense of hope and some of their stories will just stick with them. And then speaking of stories that will stick with them there, these farmers are also sharing family recipes uh, that have Land O'Lakes butter in them, of course, but I got to make the recipes as well and enjoy them and food is my love language. So that's something really cool that viewers will get to enjoy as well. Uh, And before I ask you about the recipes, because that's always going to be interesting to me and the people uh, uh, that I, uh, uh, that I communicate with, what, what kind of inspired you to get involved in the project in the first place? What was the, uh, what was the impetus? Well, right now I am all about being a part of anything that's wanting to highlight hard workers here in America. I work in country music. I have a lot of farmers that listen to our morning show, the Bobby bone show. And mm-hmm. I have an ag degree from Texas A&M grew up in Texas with ranchers and farmers in my family. And I feel like for me, it was kind of getting back to the roots of growing up a city girl, some stuff I didn't really get to experience, even though some people in my family, that was 100% their world. And I was always a little bit jealous of it, to tell you the truth. I think it's kind of, you, you want what you don't have. Probably some of my small town farming, ranching family, they would be like, some of the kids would want to grow up in the city and see what that's like. For me, I was always jealous of my half sister and her farming lifestyle. I always wanted that. And she was an FFA and had her own goats and cows and all these things. And so for me, a little selfishly, I just wanted to tap into that world because I've always been uh, curious about it. And then again, just being a part of something positive and highlighting uh, these farmers, like everyday people that are, are doing their part to keep everything going. So I signed me up. And then the really cool thing that got me was how Lando Lakes was partnering with Feeding America on the whole project. Mm -hmm. So when you go to facebook.com slash Lando Lakes, if you comment on an episode, there's six episodes total. You can do it on every single one. You comment, 
you enjoy the video, you share the video. For every comment and share, they are donating a pound of macaroni and cheese to the Feeding America Food Bank. And so, I mean, how can you not be a part of that? Yes, I, I agree with you, and I'm glad that you uh, are a part. And uh, anything that uh, you know that I can do to help, I'm happy to. I um, uh, what did I want to ask you? Tell me a little bit about uh, before we uh, uh, tell the folks where they can actually watch. Uh, you know, the episodes and all that. W w let's talk recipes. What uh, What's exciting recipe-wise for you? Well, my kids would vote that these uh, crescent rolls were their favorite thing that we made. I'll save the recipe for the episode. You'll have to watch it to find out. But I, got you. Okay. I made tons of these. They were in a bag, and I had them on my counter. And uh, I think within, like, two days, my kids had gone through every roll. So those are a winner for them. And then for me, there's these pecan bars that we made that are amazing. Do you say pecan or pecan? Well, to be honest with you, uh, as an East Coaster, we do say pecan, but I, I'm fine with pecan as well, you know. Okay. Well, so pecan, pecan bars, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. hands down my favorite. I was, I even had to pass them out to some of my neighbors so that I didn't eat them all, which I was think after I'm not even joking, I was thinking about how these farmers connect with their community and their neighbors. And there's just something like, like warm and fuzzy about the farming life and the farming community to me. And I hope that that transfers to the viewers, but I was like, you know what? We just moved. I barely know my neighbors. So I use that as an opportunity to share the recipe that we made of the bars and get to know my neighbors and go take it to them. Because I, again, I crave that small town community lifestyle. And here I am in the big city and I didn't even know my new neighbors. So it pushed me to go do that. So maybe it'll encourage other people to do that as well. That's, that's nice as well. I, I think that people, you know, forget during this whole, you know, crisis, which everyone is just kind of, you know, you know, just exhausted by at this point that uh that there is so many um uh so many people suffering and i i'm not i don't want to get negative about it but i mean you know you you, you know that people are out of work you know that restaurants are having a, a really difficult time and then we forget sometimes the rest of the supply chain so anything that we can do to help uh you, you know the farmers is is crucially important to, to keep kind of uh, to keep business going to keep people employed and to keep you know, to keep products uh, 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 coming to uh, coming to market. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that because that's one hundred percent true, and the reason why I'm excited to be a part of this and why Lando Lakes wanted to even to to do this. And yeah, for people to feel that connection and know that somebody worked really hard to make that butter happen, and that there's a lot that's going on across the country on these family farms. That again, I think when you're at the grocery store unless you have someone tell you these stories, you're not going to ever know the people behind the product. And Land Lakes is a farmer owned cooperative. And I, I want to help spread that message. Great. That's great. Now, now uh, that's a perfect introduction to where uh, people are going to see the stories. How do we, uh, how do we find the stories? An easy way to do it is facebook.com slash Land Lakes. I feel okay. like that's a simple way for people to remember. So uh, if you forget, but you know that it's Land Lakes and something about goodness, I'm sure you can just try to Google Land Lakes where goodness grows or Amy Brown or something, and hopefully it'll take you to that link. But facebook.com slash Land Lakes. And again, that's where you can view each episode and you can comment or share the video because for every comment or share a pound of macaroni and cheese is being donated through Land Lakes Thanks. to Feeding America. So just remember that. Don't forget. Excellent. I will make sure that uh, that I mention it more than one time when I uh, when I repeat this story. It's going to be Facebook.com uh, slash Land Lakes. We're going to watch some video uh, uh, pieces, stories uh, about America's uh, dairy farmers. And then we're going to comment and we're going to pick up some of these delicious recipes that you referred to. You got it. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, Amy Brown. Appreciate the, uh, the time and really, uh, 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 you know, respect uh, that, you're, uh, that you're doing your part uh, to make our uh, little uh, country uh, a better place for the people that are growing uh, and uh, processing and delivering our, uh, our dairy. Awesome. Thank you so much for helping us spread the message. Glad to. Thanks for, uh, thanks for chatting. Talk to you soon. Okay.
Bye. Bye. How right. you doing? All right, hang on. Doing great. How about you? Oh yeah, we heard Excellent. that already. Uh, thank you. Glad to uh, let's make to that make stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, back with you. That uh, was uh, as I had promised. Uh, my uh, quick conversation there with Amy Brown. Facebook dot uh, com. Uh, Land of Lakes. Check it out. Uh, support farmers. Buy Land of Lakes butter. I always do. Nothing wrong with that. Good stuff. Uh, I want to just uh, now for these uh, for the little bit here. Let's. I want to go back to this conversation about what we're making because again, I um, <clears throat> I, I think they're back in season. You know, sometimes I go to the supermarket. You can't get the uh, you can't get sweet potatoes. I think the sweet potatoes are underrated. Underrated. That's where I come from. Uh, in the in the list of what what would be considered superfoods. Uh, sweet potatoes are going to show up on your top 10. They're just loaded with nutrients, uh, vitamin C, beta carotene, whatever else it is that goes in there. They're super good for you. I mean, they are, from a nutritional standpoint, uh, more uh, powerful and positive than regular old potatoes. They, These things are packing a punch. And the thing about sweet potatoes is, you, you, you know, it's one of those foods that doesn't really need a lot of help. I mean, you could pretty much roast a sweet potato and eat it and go, I'm not sure it needs anything. Uh, would it hurt to have butter? No. Would a little bit of uh, salt be good? Sure. Uh, but what I'm saying is that, man, that's a lot of flavor from one single ingredient. Now, if you want to do something more uh, with your uh, sweet potatoes, I, you know, I'm not a patient guy, but uh, I'll throw them in the oven for an hour at uh, 400, 450. Uh, you, you, it's very hard to kind of kill them. I mean, what I'm saying is, you know, they could take the heat for an hour. They could take the high heat for an hour. And then that outside gets a little bit crispy. I'm an outside eater. Not everybody is. You could scoop it out. Sure, it's great with butter. I don't think olive oil is going to hurt you. Uh, uh, like I said, salt and pepper are fine. I, I like hitting up a sweet potato with a little uh, spice mixture. I happen to like a spice called uh, Middle Eastern spice called Baharat. Uh, I like a Moroccan spice called Raz El Hanout. Both of those uh, feel they're like warm uh, uh, spices in that they have the cinnamon and the nutmeg and those kind of uh, uh, that kind of flavor profile. So a little pinch of that in a sweet potato is great. But here's a recipe that I'm going to share with you for uh, sweet potatoes, which uh, has only four ingredients, two of which are salt and pepper. So, like, this has my name written on it because basically it's two ingredients, right? It's sweet potatoes and olive oil. I mean, I don't, I don't consider salt and pepper being like, oh, that's two ingredients. I mean, you just have salt and pepper. You're going to want to have, though, not table salt. You're going to want to have kosher salt or some other salt that has some kind of texture to it, like Florida cell, something that has a little bit of, um, uh, uh, you, you know, coarseness to it. Anyway, uh, heat your oven. So the thing about these these potatoes, here's where, why I mentioned that I am uh, not the most patient, because these uh, sweet potatoes are literally going to go into your oven at a low heat for two and a half hours. Now, that's a, you know, you don't need to. Like I said, I'll go high heat for an hour. I'm good. In this case, heat your oven to 275. Arrange sweet potatoes on a large foil-lined bake sheet. Why is your bake sheet foil-lined? And the answer is so that you don't have to clean your bake sheet after you're done with your potatoes. You simply will throw away the foil. So much better. Uh, rub each sweet potato with a teaspoon of olive oil, a half a teaspoon of salt, which will bake a very salty skin. You can use a little bit less if you want. And there's a quarter of a teaspoon of pepper until it's well-coated. You're going to bake it until it's very soft inside and it's caramelized on the bottom. It's going to be about two and a half hours. Then, as if that weren't enough, you're going to heat the broiler and run the potatoes underneath it. That could be anywhere from one to two to five to ten minutes, depending on the intensity of your broiler. But you want to get a little char on these things. After which, you're going to let them sit for ten minutes. Then you're gently going to crush them with your hands. You're going to expose the flesh. Season it with some salt, pepper, finish it with a little bit of butter or any kind of topping of your choice. Then those toppings can be sizzling spices, garlic, red pepper, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so, yeah, sweet potatoes 
healthy, delicious, easy. Available at your local Costco, generally. I mean, not always. Uh, how about... I've got to say, I'm, I don't know, I'm so tempted to... Well, let's see what the story is here, because I'm looking at a recipe right now, and I'm thinking, this is really all I want. I've made this kind of thing before. I've had this kind of dish before. I love chicken. I love chicken, and if I had to pick one piece of chicken, and, oh, and, and, and man... I mean, a wing, like, is a beautiful thing. But if I had to pick one piece of chicken uh, to live with for the rest of my life, it would be the chicken thighs, which I buy by the gross ton at Costco. That is correct. And uh, they generally give you a choice over there. You can buy them, like, on the bone, or then you can buy them organic, skinless, boneless. It's all good. All good. This recipe that I'm going to share with you now is for salt and vinegar chicken and <clears throat> Having had, uh, like, vinegar-based uh, chicken before, I I love the heck out of it. Have you ever had the salt and vinegar potato chips? They're good, too. But so, too, are salt and vinegar good on um, on chicken. Have you ever gone and had fish and chips in uh, London town? They serve their... Uh, you know, they serve their uh, chips, their crisps over there, their uh, potato chips with, uh, you know, salt and uh, malt vinegar. Anyway, the combination of the vinegar and the salt, uh, obviously, is a good thing. Here is a recipe that, again, uh, requires only, uh, you know, five, six ingredients. Love that. My favorite of which, of course, is the chicken thighs. These happen to be bone in. You're also going to need some sliced white onions. You hear that and you go, what's that all about? And the answer is, that's actually about sweetness. Because when you cook onions long enough, you know the sweetness comes out of them. So you get a little bit of bite, you get a little bit of flavor, you get a little sweet. I need one and a half cups of white vinegar from you, my friends, or a cup of water to tame all that white vinegar. We're going to use oregano. If you got it fresh, great. Most of us don't. Perfect. Out of a jar, dried. And then I need some salt and pepper. Because I'm going to take the salt and the pepper and the oregano, and I'm going to put it on those chicken pieces. I'm going to put that chicken skin side down in a roasting pan without aluminum, directly into the roasting pan, because I want the confrontation with the metal. I don't want anything getting between me and the heat of the roasting pan, which is going to caramelize the chicken. I'm going to cover this chicken now with the sliced onions, I'm going to add the vinegar and water. Oh, you know what that sounds like. A cup and a half of vinegar and a quarter of a cup of water. I'm going to add that to this thing. And I'm going to put the heat up to 400, or it will be preheated on 400. And I'm going to cook it for an hour. And then uh, I'm going to turn the, the, the chicken over and cook it at an even higher heat, 425, uh, for another hour and 15 minutes without being covered. So this chicken on the thigh is going in for a very long time in a vinegar and a, a little bit of water combination with onion, salt, pepper, and oregano. And I can't wait to have that because I love that particular combination of food. One uh, final uh, recipe idea, I suspect, before I say, uh, before I bid you adieu this evening and it is for, and only I'm giving you this one because I actually made it. And I am not a baker. Uh, my family makes generally fun of me. Oh, you, you can't bake. And, of course, this is wrong. They're wrong. I just don't care about it as much. And, you know, it, it requires, like, actually measuring out ingredients and all that fucking happy, you know, a little bit of this. It's got to be specific about that. I'm not, that's not my thing. Not my thing. But I had some fresh apples, and I read a recipe for an apple cake. And what intrigued me about the recipe was that uh, she said, uh, 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 what's her name? Um, that's her mom's recipe. What is her name? Smitten Kitchen. She says in the thing, she says in the notes, you know, this stuff is good when you make it, but, man, it gets even better the next day because the, the, the cake is kind of like custardy. So for those of you who like to bake, who those of you who like sweetness, for those of you who like dessert and apples, Mom's Apple Cake, September 30, 2008, Mom's Apple Cake uh, in Smitten Kitchen uh, requires the use of six uh, apples, 
uh, that we rec- that we need nothing more to flavor them than a tablespoon of uh, ground cinnamon and five tablespoons of granulated sugar. All right, your apple mix is ready. The rest is the batter. And you know what you need for a batter? You need flour, uh, a, a little bit of baking powder. You need some salt and you can and some vegetable oil or sunflower oil or whatever kind of oil you want to use or even melted butter. And then, again, sugar. And here's the trick. quarter of a cup of orange juice, a little bit of vanilla extract, four eggs. And that's really what it comes down to. We don't have time to get into the specifics. It'd be just as easy, if this is interesting to you, to go to Smitten Kitchen and look up Mom's Apple Cake recipe and get the, uh, the, get the precise measurements here and do it. And you do it because it is fantastic. It is just uh, awesomely uh, delicious. The apples are sweet. They're caramelized. The cake is moist and kind of almost uh, not creamy. That's the wrong word. Uh, 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 but it has a pudding-like kind of texture. Uh, in fact, I don't. I like it fresh. I, I, I ate it for two or three days because she was right. It got better every day. Uh, but my wife cuts a slice of this thing, puts it in the toaster oven. You know, he likes that texture on it. So, uh, yeah, there's the. we've run the gamut here in, uh, in uh, episode number uh, 91 from uh, uh the stuff that we've been uh, we've been cooking and making uh, you know the pork chops the uh, uh the rat tattooey the the sweet potatoes uh, uh you, you know all that kind of stuff the scallops oh get your hand. they're not cheap i mean what is it these days it's a pound of scallops a lot of money but do yourself a favor you don't want them frozen uh you you, you don't want them uh, uh farmed fresh Sea scallops, and we're getting to the season right now where what you're going to start seeing in the market is the bay scallops. They come out of the bay, not the sea. They're tiny, like also delicious. Also delicious. So, yeah, we did all that. We had a nice conversation with Amy Brown, Nashville, Tennessee, doing work for Land of Lakes. Please support your local farmers and your restaurants. And, my friends, uh, a little bit, we ended with something sweet, which is the way we'd like to end any kind of delicious meal with a little something sweet. Apple cake from uh, from Deb, uh, I don't remember Deb's name. Smitten Kitchen is what you need to know. You go Smitten Kitchen, you look that up, and you go Mom's Apple Cake, and you make that fantastic. And there you have it, episode 91 of All You Can Eat. I am Rob Rosenthal, coming to you live each Wednesday at 8 p.m. here on the On Radio Network. You can also hear the show on iHeartRadio simply by looking up All You Can Eat or Rob Rosenthal in the podcast section. And uh, you can also, if you're a Spotify person, as I am, you can also get the All You Can Eat podcast on Spotify. Buy my book if you are interested in 100 fabulous recipes and how to cook them all. It's called it's called Short Order Dad, One Guy's Guide to Making Food Fun and Hassle-Free. You can find it on Amazon. And you'll find me here next week uh, on uh, All You Can Eat. Until then, my friends, remember, life is a short, so never waste a meal.